on to the next pixel. Same goes for a greater than threshold of 45. Then you calculate the angle of the two pixels and store it in alpha. Calculate the midpoint and store it in M. Now we'll once again look at every other white pixel, hence the ON cubed, and call this one XK. For each XK, calculate the distance between it and M and store that in D. Compare that to, B, to a B threshold of 15 minimum, 40 max, and if it fails, move on to the next one. Then you calculate the angle between XK and M and store that in theta. And then for the heart of the alg algorithm, you calculate the B value of the ellipse for these points using a bit of algebra against an ellipse equation, and you can come up with this. Hold on a second. You come up with this equation right here, and that'll calculate the B for you from all of the other things you've already calculated. Then you increment the B count for the found B. So if B's, you found two, or if B is two, then you record that two is shown up once. If it appears from another XK, then it's appeared twice, et cetera. Once all the XKs have been exhausted, find the B value that has appeared the most often and compare this value against every other XI, XJ, pairs against B, or pairs highest B count, whichever has the largest amount of values they create the most amount of similar B values is the best fit ellipse for the image. Now that you have the best fit ellipse values, you can easily calculate everything you need to draw the ellipse. So in summary, the algorithm tries every combination of pixels as endpoints of the ellipse. From there, it finds the most amount of pixels that will create a similar B value for an ellipse, which essentially means that they land on the ellipse circumference. And then out of all the XI, XJ pairs, whichever one has the most amount of pixels along their ellipse is the winner. Okay, so you can see here where it found the ellipses using that algorithm. Um, now that we have our estimations as to where the ellipses are, we'll go back to our pre-outlined images and remove the inversion. That's pretty uh, straightforward. Obviously, if anything lands on or in the ellipse, you, and it's white, you set it black. If it's black, you set it white. If it's outside the ellipse, you ignore it. And that's what I did down here. And it comes out to this. And you can see it on here. There's this little leftover artifact because it didn't perfectly find the ellipse in referendum. So I'm going to clean that up with an algorithm next. Okay, so take out the artifacts. I just use an algorithm called clean loners. You pass two arguments. One's the radius of the area you want to check around the pixel, and the second is the ratio of white pixels you're expecting in that area. So if the rate is less than what you're expecting, then you uh, remove the pixel or set it black. Otherwise, you ignore it. So in this example, I'm just showing two pixels. And say you um, set the radius to two and the minimum ratio to point two. In the first one yellow, you have seven white pixels, and there's 25 total, so seven out of 25 is 0.28, and that's greater than 0.2, so it passes, and you leave it white. On the second example, it's only three out of 25, and it does not pass, it's not greater than 0.2, so you remove it. You do that for every single pixel, and that'll take care of the artifacts. You can see how the one that was down below referendum is gone now. <clears throat> okay, so now we got the vertical ribbon in, and this is kind of a pain. Well, what we use is, a, uh, is an algorithm I refer to as the blanket algorithm. Basically, it involves the discovery of a series of tangents along the top and bottom of the word in order to deduce the severity of the vertical offset along the x-axis. Obvious pitfalls are when there are tails and heads to letters, you know, like P and D, and et cetera. But it's usually not that much of a problem. Okay, so how this works is for every single pixel on the, along the bottom or top of the word, in this example, I'll just go along the bottom, but without loss of generality. Um, I'll start here at the green pixel, and you'll walk a pixel to the left, and if the slope from here to this um, pixel here is larger than what you currently have in the beginning, it's a zero, then you keep it. So now you'd start right here, and then you'd walk a pixel to the right. If it's less, if the slope's less than what you pr previously have on the right, then you keep it. So you keep going all the way until you reach what, the, can't, what can't make it any larger on the left and smaller on the right which is these two pixels. Then you interpolate where the pixel would land for the green one here, and that's your new pixel. And this down here explains the algorithm. Um, <clears throat> you can find it on my website, because I don't think the uh, slides are actually on the CD. Um, okay, also you want to ensure that the final slopes aren't too large, because if they are, then you're going to have a vertical line at some point, and you really don't want that. Um, so once the best fit tangent is found, your simple calculation can interpolate where the x would land on the tangent line. And now that it's been calculated for every pixel on the x-axis, you take the new values and smooth them out with some simple averaging along like the 10 left pixels and 10 uh, values and right values. Um, so that was simple and solves all the ribboning techniques implemented by every CAPTCHA system. I'm not sure if this already exists or not, 
but I've named it the blanket algorithm. Feel free to call it whatever you like. So this is how you remove the ribbon in here. From here, it's an obvious fix to just drop each pixel by the vertical offset. Just average the top and bottom blanket values and drop each pixel in that column down to the floor. And you can see here how I'll resume the referendum. Now I no longer have an inverted blob and the ribboning has been taken care of. It's not perfect, but it's pretty damn close. And all I promised was 10%, so. <clears throat> all right, this is the old capture from 2007, one of their originals. And while this isn't technically the current one right now, because they changed it, like I said, a week before, but um, I'm just going to keep calling it current until I get to the end. Uh, character dilation in the current version of recapture makes decoding significantly more challenging, because character segmentation is the largest challenge for many capture crackers and OCRs. The old capture was an absolute joke. And then there's some anti-aliasing exploits, because in the original one, you could easily segment the characters based off of the anti-aliasing. And that line could easily be removed with that as well. You could just look for the darkest, most black pixels, and the line barely had any. So you could almost just completely remove it by doing that. Um, and then OCR failures generate natural word distortions because obviously an OCR has a problem solving a word. It's going to have some problems in the word, so that comes up with natural distortions in the CAPTCHA. Um, OK, now we're going to go into character segmentation, which is one of the harder parts of this. Um, you could brute force character start stop points along the x-axis, but that's exponentially, you know, challenging and it's just really not a good idea. So what I did is I came up with a bunch of educated guesses. And then I use CMAPs and I go into their training usage and why I use CMAPs instead of a neural network. Excuse me. Yeah. What's that? I'll go into that shortly. <clears throat> um, Okay, so for the character segmentation, um, I find some dips in the top and bottom of the words after a specialized version of my blanket routine. You can see how, if you ignore the lines, um, like the vertical lines, you can see how the blanket routine goes in and into the crevices of each character. And whenever it falls deep into one, there's nowhere to go but up is where I marked a line. And those are the start and stop points that I'm gonna use to test for each character. It makes it a lot easier than trying every single point. Um, from this technique lowers the potential start-stop locations from a boot force of 126 and 140 down to an educated guess of 20 and 22, which is exponential, and so that brings it down to about 97.6 more efficient than testing every single point. Okay, so the CMAP stands for character map. I just named it that, I don't know. Um, it's a compilation of hundreds of sampled characters. The more it's trained, the more efficient it becomes. It works like a neural network, Yet it's far more simple. I use it instead of a neural network because I tried all the different ways that people implement OCRs with neural networks and my CMAP worked the best. So that's why I stuck with it. At least with this CAPTCHA, that is. Um, once it's trained sufficiently, it's applied to every combination of the character start and stop points that match certain guidelines that determine their likelihood of a match. Okay, so you take a character group you'd like to train discover the average dimensions for that character, and then interpolate each character to that size. Add up the matrices of pixels and divide by their total and you have yourself a CMAP. So in this case, I use three eyes. Um, you can see how the first top left pixel, there's one in every one, so the CMAP has a one. In the far right, there's only two out of three, so it's 0.6. And you just do that with hundreds of characters and you get a basic average of each character. Um, the final matrix can be used to determine the probability of a pixel existing for that eye. And below is a visual representation of the CMAP that I used in, um, in this current CAPTCHA. The brighter the pixel, the more likely it exists for that character. And you can see how in words that are letters that are less trained, like Q, it's a lot more fuzzy, but like E looks a lot better just because it was trained more often. Okay, so an interesting unfixable flaw with recaptcha is the fact that every word is in fact just the actual real dictionary-based word. So to improve the efficacy, we'll exploit that flaw with a dictionary list. We use a modest list of about 100,000 words and you can find it on my website. Um, so to apply the CMAP and dictionary attack, for every combination of possible start-stop character points, calculate the height by finding the highest and lowest white pixels between them. For each character in the CMAP, check to see if the dimensions of the potential character fall within a set threshold of the dimensions of the CMAP character. So for instance, if you had a W and you were going to compare it against an I in the CMAP, there'd be no reason to because the dimensions are off. Um, if one does, then apply the image to the CMAP character to calculate its probability of being the character. 
Now using a dynamic algorithm, calculate the total probability of each word in your dictionary list for matching that word or matching that captcha. The word with the highest probability is your word about 10% of the time. Okay, so this is the dynamic algorithm. Um, this just generates the probability that a word matches your CMAP or the uh, ratio data that you calculated with the CMAP. So every start and stop point that have a probability for every character in the CMAP, assuming that it passed the dimensions, this list of information is referred to as the CDR. And I'll illustrate this with just the example car. Um, imagine that there's three C's, two A's, and four R CDR values. So in the beginning here, you have the three C's, and their uh, ratio data is five, two, and three. And this pick, or it founded at XI equals zero, and the X final is nine. Um, and then that goes, goes on for A and R, et cetera. So in the dynamic algorithm, you would multiply the ratio data by the width of the character. So in the first one, um, C0, it'd be five times 10 and on down, et cetera. So now for the next letter, A, you find out which um, C the A falls in and doesn't overlap, and the highest value of that you, multiply, or you add it to it. So in the first one, A starts at four, goes to 11. Um, so you come over here and you see that it doesn't land in anything except the second one, which is, wait, let's see here. Oh yeah, so then you add eight to it, because that's the only one that'll land in. So eight comes over here and gets added to the, um, to the final product. Same goes for the next day, runs from 10 to 18. Um, it'll fit the first one and the last one, because 10 to 18 comes after nine, and after nine here. And the highest one between those two is 50, so you add that to the final product, and so on and so forth until you have the final value, and that would be 118. So the, the largest probability for the word car to fit from our CDR data calculated from the image is 118. And the real project uses fractions from zero to one instead of whole numbers. Okay, so the last step is to divide the entire total by the total width of the image, and the final product is the word's true probability, and it'll be a value between zero and one, like all good probabilities should be. All right, so a few issues. There can be rare problems where it's not the largest probability, and that can be fixed by allowing wild cards, but that did not improve the algorithm, so I'm not talking about it. Um, so you apply this algorithm to every word in your dictionary list, and the highest word is the winner. Okay, so my experimental results from using all these techniques, it's difficult to determine because I didn't actually apply it to their system, instead I downloaded tons of their captures, named them, and then determined how well it worked. The problem with that is you can't know exactly which word's a verification word, so I just use a couple tricks to kind of guess statistically. Um, so if the words are distorted beyond a certain point, or if they're shorter than a few letters, or if they can't contain numbers, then it's definitely not the verification word. And in some instances, it's impossible to tell the difference without trying it natively on reCAPTCHA. But in an analysis of, analysis of 16,555 CAPTCHAs, 313 of them contained a word containing a number, and 6,712 of them had a word of less than or equal to three characters in size, meaning that about 42% of the CAPTCHAs supplied by reCAPTCHA can have the verification word easily determined. And that statistic is not including overly distorted words, which could make that up to half. So the system was set up to, system was set up to run for a day, testing 4,690 downloaded random CAPTCHAs that were not used to train the system in any way. And since I downloaded the images and not run the system against reCAPTCHA servers, I needed to determine the words, which one's a verification word myself. And the results for this experiment came to 873 instances where one or both of the two words were correct. That gives an eff efficacy of about 18.5%. After removing all instances where the correct word was less than or equal to three characters, there's a total of 630 correct. That leaves an overall efficiency of 13.5%. Of course, there are the instances where the system is answering the digitization word correct instead of the verification word, concluding however this happens half the time is far too conservative considering the digitization word is often more distorted. A safe conservative number for the results in this experiment to have accidentally answered the word other than the verification word would be about 25%. So here's a breakdown of the CAPTCHAs solved with those 4,000 some CAPTCHAs. Um, I'd say about 25% of them up here would be the digitization word, 25% um, verification word, and half of the time you know that it's which one's which so you don't have to worry about it. Since half the time it is not possible to guess which word is the verification word and there is still a 50% chance, so that comes out to about 25%, so, but this is still a highly conservative number. But if you apply that to the 13% of efficiency rate, it comes out to about 10%. So 
So you say about 3% of the time it gets the um, digitization.